Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Carter Beck. Dr. Beck is a neurosurgeon. He did his medical school training at the University of Chicago School of Medicine. From there, he completed a neurosurgical residency at Stanford University. Good morning, Dr. Beck. Good morning, Dr. Seacrest. Dr. Beck, what I would like to discuss over the next half hour is uh, a new procedure, a relatively new procedure, uh, in most spine surgery practices, which is uh, referred to as intraoperative monitoring. Now, as I understand, this is a technique uh, that you're beginning to use and most spine surgeons are beginning to use when you're doing spine surgery near the spinal cord, you're beginning to monitor patient spinal cord so that you can tell the minute something happens that may put the spinal cord or the spinal nerves at risk. Now, that's my understanding. Can you explain a little bit about uh, what this new um, technique is and when it's appropriate to use? Well, you know, Randall, there's been a lot of fads in spine surgery over the years, various bells and whistles, gimmicks, procedures which come and go, um, adjuncts to surgery. Um, intraoperative monitoring has been around for a long time um, and, it, and used in various um, uh, capacities and for various reasons, usually focusing on the, focusing on the spinal cord in, um, in particular. Um, Recently, uh, the scope uh, and frequency with which we are employing interoperative monitoring has expanded quite a bit, and we believe it's an important uh, part of, uh, of good spine surgical technique and, and not a fad and not uh, a gimmick, but something that it really uh, is helpful to the patients and to their surgeon. Um, one of the problems in dealing with uh, really all neurosurgery, um, uh, and in this instance spinal surgery, is that when a patient is on the operating table anesthetized, uh, the uh, physician loses feedback from the target organ, which in this case is the nervous system, central or peripheral nervous system. Um, and so they are, are basically guessing uh, as to whether what they're doing is acceptable to that organ and whether or not um, that organ is going to function properly once the patient is awakened. And so there's sort of a, um, a been a time-honored thing in neurosurgery is you know, we'll see when the patient wakes up uh, how we did which is different, I think, than, say, what a heart surgeon does. It, it, they, they get pretty instantaneous feedback about how they're doing because they, there's bleeding, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes very impressive bleeding. And, and that uh, uh, tells them a lot, uh, that they can monitor their blood pressure, and that really is, is giving them instantaneous feedback uh, from the target organs. Um, so in spine surgery, what we have um, done for years, but now do, I think as a, as a rule, um, very regularly on almost every case, is to, uh, is to monitor the function of, of an anesthetized patient's nervous system. And that can be done uh, in a number of ways. The, one of the easiest ways is to do what's called EMG, or electromyography. Um, if you stick a, a very small needle into a, a muscle group, uh, you can monitor uh, impulses uh, from nerves that go to the muscle group. And so, for example, if a surgeon is operating on somebody's lumbar spine and uh, the muscle group starts to twitch, it may be that he's putting too much pressure on a nerve in the course of trying to, to say, take out a herniated disc or, uh, or, or reconstruct the spine. Um, and so, uh, over time, we found that this is very valuable for a surgeon. It gives the surgeon, if nothing else, a lot of confidence that what they're doing at a given moment in time is okay. And if they do something which is irritating the nerve, they, they find out quite, uh, quite quickly. A couple of questions. Um, one is, is, my understanding is that, like you say, this has been around for a long time, but people didn't really use it that much. Do you think that the rise of minimally invasive surgical procedures where you can't really see? You know, in the old days, uh, we tended to look at what we were doing, and now we're doing more things blindly to some degree, using x-ray control and that sort of thing. So we're not really seeing those nerves. We're not really seeing the spinal cord. And do you think that's, that's putting those nerves more at risk, and maybe that's the, the impetus for having more spine surgeons sort of now using this technology? 
I think that's part of it, certainly. Um, when you uh, do a percutaneous procedure and the skin is between you and the nerves, it, it, or the surgeon and the nerves, it, it certainly is it's very helpful to have this kind of monitoring. Um, I think that the, the technology has also improved. It's now uh, fairly uh, straightforward for us to get this accomplished in the operating room uh, at the level of a community hospital, whereas in the past, this was very sophisticated, uh, cutting edge technology that really existed mainly in uh, academic centers. I think also the tolerance for, uh, for bad outcomes or for uh, mysterious uh, nerve injuries after surgery is, is much lower in America today. I think people expect and demand uh, things uh, to be perfect. And, um, and this is one way that a surgeon can, can help try to move the ball forward and get closer to that goal. I think that's an idealistic goal, but it, it's, um, it certainly is a valid one. Yeah. Well, we, we currently uh, obviously do just lots of different types of monitoring to try to reduce risk. And as you say, this is one more uh, technique that's available. And if it can reduce the risk at a reasonable cost, then it's probably a good trade-off. Right. Today, uh, today with a few uh, electrodes and uh, wires uh, hooked to the patient in a laptop computer, we can, we can get a lot of instant feedback uh, uh, to the spine surgeon about what they're, what they're doing and how well the nervous system is tolerating it. So it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that we took a look at a, a year or two ago uh, with a somewhat uh, skeptical eye as to whether this was really necessary, as to whether it would be helpful. And uh, we found that it's very practical and very effective and, and all of us feel much more comfortable uh, doing uh, the procedures that we do when we have uh, interoperative monitoring available. Um, and, uh, and today the majority of the cases that I do are monitored. What types of procedures would you recommend that uh, interop monitoring can reduce the risk and which types of procedures do you feel are not necessarily serious enough or the risk is not serious enough that the interop monitoring um, extra cost is justified? Well, when I trained uh, Randall, the, um, the interop monitoring for spine surgery was pretty much isolated to uh, working in and around the spinal cord and we would monitor the function of the long tracks which go from the brain through the spinal cord and out into, uh, into the peripheral nervous system. Um, so a spinal cord tumor, which is a rare thing, uh, would get interoperative monitoring. As I've said, over the last 10 years, the, the scope uh, uh, has expanded. Currently today, I, I do it, or try to do it, uh, when practical for every spinal surgery, even a simple outpatient microdiscectomy one of the m most minimal surgeries that I do, I think it, it's nice to have because a part and parcel of a simple microdiscectomy is retraction of the nerve. Uh, and not every nerve root uh, is, uh, tolerates retraction in the same way. And there certainly are cases, not very common, in fact rare, where um, actually the nerve is injured by a retractor. Um, and this is feedback as to whether or not that's the case. And uh, even more importantly, it removes uh, ambiguity. There are, there are some times when patients have a problem after surgery that we don't understand. The qu and the question always arises, well, did we do something to the nerve during surgery? This removes that, that ambiguity. If the, if the nerve uh, didn't squeak while we were working on it during surgery, the surgery didn't cause it. And I think and it's pretty objective and definitive evidence. So as far as I'm concerned right now, there's really uh, no spinal surgical procedure where it's unnecessary. And, I, and I'm employing it fully in my practice. Um, well, let me paraphrase a couple of things that, that you've just said so that I can understand it and I hope the audience can understand it. When you use the term retracting the nerve root, what we're really talking about is putting a special instrument on a nerve and pulling it to the side so that you can perform the surgery. Correct. In the old days, you didn't know if that was causing any damage to that nerve at the time or not. You had to wait until the patient woke up and you still didn't know whether that caused the damage or what. You just knew you pulled the nerve to the side. What you're saying, I think, is that with the constant interop monitoring, the minute you pull that nerve, if the machine tells you you're pulling too hard, you can stop. That's absolutely right. And protect that nerve. That's before right. permanent damage occurs. And you can document that as well. 
right. uh, that, that there was no, when you pull the nerve, there was no damage. So pulling that nerve with a retractor could not have caused the, 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 the end result. If, if there's a problem with surgery, unfortunately, they're very rare, but uh, it's very nice for the relationship between a patient and a surgeon for the surgeon to say, I monitored and I know that what we did was normal, what we did was acceptable, and that there wasn't any problem there, so we need to look for alternative explanations. Well, now let's talk a little bit about what that means to the patient. You mentioned that, that you were using small little needle electrodes. I'm assuming that these electrodes are placed after the patient's asleep. So the patient's not going to recognize any difference in terms of the operation by doing monitoring. That's true. Sometimes these days they're actually placed uh, in the preoperative holding area. It's, it's not a very uncomfortable thing for patients, but they can be, certainly be placed when patients are, are anesthetized. Um, and for, for the patient, I think it's really no change. And, um, uh, and for us, it, it's a significant added uh, layer of, of caution and, uh, and safety. Now, one thing patients are, are probably going to want to know, and that is cost, because this is obviously um, a level above the norm. It, in, it, inc it increases the number of people in the operating room that are actually doing this monitoring. And as I understand it, most cases of intraop monitoring are actually being monitored by a neurologist or some person who is skilled, that's not in the operating room, but is, is skilled at, at uh, reading these, these scans and watching all the time. And the interesting thing about the internet is that in a lot of cases this is now being done over the internet where the person actually watching your surgery, reading your printout is in another state. Right, again, and here's technology uh, helping us out here. Um, it's now we can have a, an expert re reviewing uh, real-time interoperative uh, uh, EMG tracings or, or um, nerve tracings. Um, who, who's a thousand miles away, mm -hmm. um, and and that certainly is helpful, particularly in, in smaller community hospitals who might not have a neurologist who can spend their time in the operating room or or a, a skilled electromyographer who can who can spend the time doing that. So I think this is increasing the scope and the availability of of this uh, increasingly important technique. And in your practice, this is something that you feel like has given you. I think you said that it makes you more comfortable. Do you really think that it's reduced your risk? Do you think that it has improved the outcomes for the patients you've done over the past year? I, I do think I've seen some benefit. I think it's a small increment. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're talking about, um, about preservation of the nervous system, a any way that we can do better uh, is valid and is important. And yes, there is some cost associated with it. Um, the insurance companies seem willing to pay because they, they recognize that, um, that a patient with a, uh, with a surgically induced nerve lesion is going to cost them a lot of money down the road. It's going to be very costly. Um, and so anything we can do to prevent those kind of, of things from occurring um, uh, is, is valid and is worthwhile, I think. Any other comments about risk and benefits of intraoperative monitoring that patients should know before they have spine surgery? Anything we haven't discussed in this, in this uh, segment? I think that uh, some of it has to do with patient's personality. Um, if, uh, I think it's important for patients to know that this technique exists and um, depending on, on their personality and their trust in their physician, if, if they trust their physician or their surgeon and their surgeon says, I don't need it, he's probably right. Um, uh, some patients want every measure of, of safety which is, uh, which is reasonable and feasible, and, and this is one of the things that's on the list. And so um, educated patients should, uh, should consider it as, a, as a one component of a, or one measure of a, of a, a skilled uh, and multidisciplinary uh, spine program. Are there any risks to the patient of interoperative monitoring? that the patient should know about? I think there's really no risk to the patient. There, occasionally a patient can get a bruise in a muscle group from, from the electrode needle that was, that was placed um, right before surgery. Um, that's a minor thing. Um, and I, I don't know that I've ever seen any complication as a direct result of the monitoring. Thank you very much for this discussion on intraoperative monitoring. I think it's an excellent a discussion of where we're headed in spine surgery in terms of reducing the risk to patients. And I think this is a technology that probably is, as you said, 
going to become the standard of care over the next few years. Yeah, I think it's here to stay. Thank, thank you, Ronald. Thank you.